We performed a retrospective analysis, which is the data that we presented at ENDO, um, where we examined 428 patients um, that presented to our weight loss management center. Um, and we basically uh, took patients who had followed up for at least two and a half years, and we studied them, we collected data up until five and a half years from that initial visit. Um, and what we found in, in our patient cohort is that they lost and maintained uh, about 10% uh, weight loss throughout the, the, the duration of the study. And that was a median of 4.7 years. Um, and these patients were taking an average of either two anti-obesity medications or three anti-obesity medications. And um, these could have been either FDA approved or um, medications that were uh, approved for another indication and used off-label uh, for weight loss. A 10% weight loss uh, that is sustained is um, associated with a number of improvement in medical conditions such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and obstructive sleep apnea. According to the Endocrine Society guidelines, um, uh, any patient who has, or any individual who has a BMI greater than 30 um, or a BMI greater than 27 with a rate-related comorbidity, such as hypertension or type 2 diabetes, um, they're indicated for an anti-obesity medication. And um, these medications should always be con in, given in conjunction with, uh, with lifestyle changes. Pharmacotherapy or anti-obesity medications um, is drastically underutilized. Um, only 2% of patients who have obesity are taking anti-obesity medication. Um, you can compare this to another chronic medical condition, such as type 2 diabetes, where 86% of patients are taking medications. So a drastic difference. Um, and, um, and that's unfortunate because the treatment of obesity uh, can improve these medical conditions. Um, obesity actually occurs upstream of the pathogenesis um, of the development of a lot of cardiovascular risk factors. So if we can uh, treat uh, the obesity first, uh, we can prevent all these things from happening. There's a number of barriers, unfortunately, to anti-obesity medication use. Um, the first is familiarity of these medications among medical providers. Um, a lot of uh, practitioners still think of the time when um, we had a number of anti-obesity medications that were actually taken off or withdrawn from the market due to either cardiovascular issues or increased risk of malignancies. However, now things have changed. We have a lot of safe and effective medications that we can use. Unfortunately, a lot of patients can't uh, get these anti-obesity medications due to insufficient insurance coverage. Um, and that's really unfortunate. It's something that we really need to change. First is uh, medical education. Um, so education of obesity medicine uh, throughout training is necessary. So we should be um, having obesity medicine education in medical school, in residency, in fellowship, and beyond. Um, that'll help uh, with the uptake of prescriptions of anti-obesity medication. Another is uh, educating the patient on what different mo treatment modalities we have uh, for the treatment of obesity, whether that be lifestyle changes, um, uh, diet, like diet and exercise, whether that be medications or bariatric surgery. The patient should know what the different options they have and be able to pick which is right for them. We need to recognize that obesity is a chronic medical condition. Uh, just like type 2 diabetes and hypertension, it's a chronic medical condition that requires chronic medical treatment. Um, so if we can actually treat the obesity with medications, we can potentially withdraw the treatment for hypertension, uh, down titrate the treatment for, hyperten uh, for hypertension or type 2 diabetes, um, and, uh, and we can have a win-win outcome.